areas. And today, of course, is a very important uh, theme of resilience and gender-based violence in the Pacific, uh, marking the 16 days of uh, activism against uh, gender-based uh, violence. I thank everyone for joining us today and looking forward to a very lively and uh, productive discussion. Uh, as usual, uh, we would now invite uh, the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, Mr. Henry Puna, to say his welcoming remarks. Dinaka, Mr. Puna, sir. Dinaka, moderator, distinguished panelists, women of the Pacific, Pulavinaka from Suva. Today, the 25th of November, marks the International Day of Elimination of Violence Against Women. It also marks the start of the global 16 days of activism campaign, which as the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, and as a husband, father, and grandfather, I am most honored to bring my voice and my support to. The truth is, I hate violence in general, but I particularly hate violence against women and girls. Our Blue Pacific must end gender-based violence. We must stop the criminal, often silent, often ignored abuse of our women and girls and our children. We must say no when we see it, when we learn of it, and when we hear of it. The onus is on all of us to stop it now. But we need to also to ask the questions. Where does the end of violence and the beginning of safety, peace, and healing begin? When do survivors unlock the keys to their own liberation and accept the support we must all offer within the law, within our communities, within our families, and within our workplaces. This is at the core of today's Blue Pacific Talanoa webinar on gender-based violence and resilience. We look forward to hearing and learning from our knowledgeable panelists today and the progressive efforts to address gender-based violence. I see our Talanoa topic today is very timely and a critical one for the Pacific as we continue to rebuild from the impacts of COVID-19 and the ongoing impacts of climate change and prepare yet again for the 2021-22 cyclone season. Our people, like so many around the world, have shown continued resilience in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing threats of climate change and disaster. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a detrimental effect on our economies and on our livelihoods. It has also had a detrimental effect on our well-being, mainly due to the continued lockdowns and restrictions. Sadly, research has shown that throughout the pandemic, gender-based violence has increased throughout our Pacific. Here at the Pacific Islands Forum, we recognize the importance of addressing gender-based violence and gender e equality. In 2021, we commissioned the review of the Pacific Leaders Gender Equality Declaration with a view to ensure that the next iteration of the declaration is relevant and fit for purpose for our region. The 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent will also provide a roadmap for strengthening and progressing gender and social inclusion here in our region. The theme of today's webinar, Resilience and Gender-Based Violence in the Blue Pacific, is particularly relevant for our current context. The ongoing threat of climate change, and the resilience of our people to pivot programs and service delivery to continue to address gender-based violence through the provision of services and advocacy should and must be applauded. Today, we will hear from those who work and serve our region in this area. 
the approaches is utilized to address gender-based violence during times of crises and risks. Resilience is not a new concept for the people of the Blue Pacific. But let me be clear, resilience is about the power to say no. It is not silence. It is not acceptance. It is about rising above, looking out for each other and asking others if they are okay and allowing survivors to be heard without shame or fear. The Pacific Islands Forum will continue to advocate for ending gender-based violence through our work and advocacy, including through the work of the Pacific Partnership of Ending Violence Against Women and Girls program, which has partnered with the Blue Pacific Talano series to bring this webinar to you. To those of you listening in or joining us today, especially those who are still experiencing abuse and suffering in your life, I hope you know that you have rights. More importantly, that you have choices and you have come this far. Today and the next 16 days is for you. To all our panelists, let me honor and pay my fullest respect to the activist activism and work you all do to keep all Pacific families safe. On that note, I wish you all the very best and thank you. Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, Mr. Huna. And also at this time, I'd like to also welcome and acknowledge Inise, our hardworking sign language interpreter. As, as is always the case, we will have now an opening statement from our members of the panel. Before then, we will we'll open up uh, the forum, the webinar, for our interesting question and answer session. So if you have uh, burning questions, urgent questions that you want the panel, members of the panels to address, do use the Q&A uh, button or the chat button uh, on your uh, Zoom uh, software and send through those questions. And we have the team at the Secretariat here in Suva to help me uh, make sure that uh, the questions are put to the members of the panel. So send those questions through while we now will welcome our um, panelists and we'll start uh, first of all, in uh, Papua New Guinea, with uh, Gabriel Shirley Kaupa. Uh, Gabriel is the founder of the Magna Carta Papua New Guinea. And uh, it's so beautiful to uh, welcome you, uh, Gabriel. Thank you for joining us from uh, Port Mosby in Papua New Guinea. And uh, for your opening statement, we would like to uh, briefly tell us about the work that you do at uh, Magna Carta particularly with that focus on the important and crucial work, as the Secretary General had mentioned, um, against gender-based violence. Thank you, uh, Gabriel. The floor is yours. Can unmute. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, um, Chair and Moderator, and good morning, um, panelists and uh, other guests, and for those ones that are with us today to acknowledge, celebrate, and participate in this EVOLVE program. I thank uh, the South Pacific Forum through this platform to give me the opportunity to share my work as a human rights defender to share my stories and my interest around human rights and the rights of the people, the women, the vulnerable that I protect and I save. And I, I thank you all for this uh, opportunity. Um, my name has already been mentioned by the moderator, uh, Shelley Gabriel Cowper, and I'm the founder of Magna Carta PNG. Magna Carta PNG, it's a community human rights platform or organization that protects and promotes uh, individual rights. And it's also a platform that 
people can use to advocate about uh, women, women rights or any other rights that is accessible and any other service that is accessible to individual people, everyday people, especially the ones that cannot stand for themselves, that cannot fight for themselves, cannot raise their voices. So Magna Carta PNG, as I've said, it's a community platform that people can use to advocate, to promote and protect human rights in Papua New Guinea. And this is the seventh year for Magna Carta. And um, we work on four pillars. Uh, we call it prayer, P for protection, R for reporting, E for education, and A for awareness. So our program starts with the education of human rights, with which we teach human rights in selected schools. So we believe that if we raise our voices through the young ones, then there'll be many human rights advocates, defenders, or activists in PNG in the future years. And our messages can be heard all over the country. And our protection work with the victims and survivors of gender-based violence, we help them through the referral pathway to access justice. We do repatriation and extra extraction of the survivors and victims. And we help them to seek justice by putting up the victim impact statement, uh, providing them um, services, information on services, like how they can access a free lawyer, when to get to courts, you know, these are the simple things that we do in our level with the everyday people. And also our support to the juvenile, juveniles at the juvenile reception. We help the police juvenile officers to run little programs to our juvenile offenders and our continuous work to advocate for human rights in PNG. So we are based in the capital uh, city, Port Mosby, and we also have our volunteers and partners in other provinces of Papua New Guinea. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing, amazing work, uh, Gabriel. I'm sure the uh, our uh, audience, who, uh, our guests who are listening in, would also want to uh, get you to elaborate more on the question and answer session, which will follow after this. But amazing work you all do, uh, Magna Carta, Papua New Guinea. The founder there, Gabriel Shirley Kalpa. We'll come back to Shirley, and if you have any question uh, for her, please do send through on the Q&A option or on the uh, chat button that you have. Uh, now we will uh, invite Mr. Isikeli Vulovo. Isikeli Vulovo is the Chief Executive Officer for the Pacific Sexual and Gender Diversity Network. Vulovo Naka Isikeli, uh, to start off your opening statement, just tell us briefly about the network that you are head of and also the work in particular that uh, the network does against gender-based violence. Thank you. We have to un un unmute yourself, please, uh, Isikel. Naka, thank you. Thank you. Benaka, what's name, Sami? Bulavanaka, everyone, and warm rainbow greetings from the Pacific Sexual and Gender Diversity Network, which Secretariat is based here in Suva, Fiji. So I'll start um, my presentation by talking a little bit about the organization, and then I will uh, shed some light about the situation uh, of gender-based violence among LGBTQI in the Pacific. And then I'll also share some of the work that uh, the PSGDN uh, is doing to address uh, gender-based violence, particularly against LGBTQI people in the Pacific. Uh, the PSGDM is actually a regional network of uh, LGBTQI organization. Uh, it brings together 14 uh, islanders of diverse desk or diverse sexual orientation and gender identity and expression and sex directly. Organization. 
40 jurisdictions across the Pacific. Uh, each of the national member organization of PSPN is deeply committed to working towards the protection and the promotion rights of uh, LGBTQI people and ensure every member of the community has freedom and opportunity to enjoy happy, healthy, and prosperous lives. Uh, some of the national member organizations have been in operation for many years and have quite strong organizational frameworks, while others operate more as a loose network of LGBTQI volunteers. Okay, and the countries where we have a uh, presence or where we have some national member organizations include American Samoa, Cook Islands, FSM, uh, Fiji, Kiri Pass, Nauru, uh, Marshall Islands, Palau, uh, PNG, uh, Samoa, Solomon Islands, uh, Tonga, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. And we hope that we will be able to reach out to other uh, countries or other states or territories that are yet to be part of the network. The capacities of each organization to implement programs and activities vary considerably, in part reflecting the legal space that LGBTQI people um, have to operate in each different country, as well as their human and financial resources, resource limits. Uh, since its Establishment in 20, 2007, the PSGDN has evolved from an issues focused group of LGBTQI activists working across the region into a more structured organization designed to support national member organizations to implement effective programs and activities in their respective home countries and two, to implement advocacy and other regional activities in collaboration with and or for the benefit of national member organization. Uh, the PSGN has grown uh, institutionally and its membership and its name and brand has expanded to Pacific Sexual and Gender Diversity Network in 2018 when we got officially registered here in Fiji. Kipati was originally registered in 2007 in Samoa before the Secretariat was moved to its chair um, in Tonga. Tonga Ladies Association was the host of the organization then, and in 2015, it was relocated to Fiji. Okay, and uh, we have um, had two strategic plans uh, ever since its uh, establishment, and we have also held and hosted two regional Pacific Human Rights Conference with a particular focus on SOGI. And the next one was supposed to be held this year, but because of COVID, we have had to delay it and we will uh, be holding the third Pacific Human Rights Conference on SOGI in 2022. In terms of the situation of violence and discrimination experienced by LGBTQI in the Pacific, uh, women and girls uh, across the Pacific, as you know, experience some of the highest rates of sexual, physical, psychological, and economic rates of gender-based violence in the world. Also subjected to these high rates of GBV are lesbian and transgender women, although they receive the least attention. In most Pacific Island countries and territories, the equality and rights of all persons, of all citizens, enshrined in constitutions However, significant inequalities continue to exist for lesbian, sexual, transgender, queer, and intersex persons. While some of our cultures recognize gender diversity, others uphold the fundamental right of freedom of expression. The Diva for Equality Fiji 2018 research report titled Unjust, Unequal, Unstoppable, Fiji Lesbians, Bisexual Women, Trans Men, and Gender Non-Conforming people tipping the scales towards justice showed that 84% of lesbian, gay, transgender women and gender non-conforming people have experienced physical, intimate partner violence. Okay, this is much greater than the percentage 
or the prevalence uh, rate for violence experienced by uh, by women okay, in Fiji. And the report further stated that another 44% who had experienced sexual assault said that they would never tell anyone except close friends, as there is a high degree of distrust of the wider Fijian society. Violence and stigma faced by the LGBTQ community in Fiji and the Pacific is disturbingly prevalent and often invisible because of the entrenched patriarchal culture of silence. Here the data has thus far revealed experiences of stigma, discrimination and violence throughout the lives of transgender and gender diverse communities across various institutions, including the family, education and healthcare settings because of their gender identity and expression. Okay, and most of the participants that participated in this transgender social experiences study said that they feel especially discriminated against in society due to their gender identity and expression. And for some, this discrimination has led to various forms of violence, including by the police. It should be noted that family violence is not a unique experience, also for trans and gender diverse communities in Fiji, uh, Samoa and PNG, because women and girls in Fiji, Samoa and PNG also uh, experience high rates of violence, which ultimately stem from what it means to be a man or woman in this social cultural context. And this contributes to high levels of violence against cisgender women and against transgender and gender diverse people who are seen to be transgressing gender norms. Okay, and to address these issues, the PSGDN is implementing uh, various uh, interventions, uh, one of which includes uh, lobbying and um, pushing for change uh, in laws, and also working with various institutions like the faith based organizations with political leaders and also with community leaders to try and change people's perception and attitudes towards uh, LGBTQI people. So maybe I'll uh, stop there for now okay. and I'm happy to answer questions later. Thank you, Iskeli Wulavo, the Chief Executive Officer for the Pacific Sexual and uh, Gender Diversity Network based in Suva, Fiji. Lots of interesting uh, information uh, and data shared there by Zukeli, and definitely it's something that we can have further discussion about. And you're most welcome to send in your questions for Zukeli Vulavo uh, uh, using the Q&A button or the chat button uh, on your Zoom uh, software. Now for our third member of the panel. She's an, a university law student and activist for the Tarifa Project in the Kingdom of Tonga. Uh, please welcome Anamalia Falemaka. Anamalia Bulavinaka Malolilei, for your three minutes of opening statement, can you briefly tell us a, a little about something about Talitha Project and the work that the project does uh, with regards to gender-based violence? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly, and uh, please do not hesitate to let me know if it's not the case. Um, as introduced, my name is Anna Malia Falemaka. I am 18 years of age, I'm probably the youngest in our panelists today, so I'm feeling a bit, uh, a bit nervous. Um, but other than that, um, I am also a trainee and mentor for Talito Project Tonga, which is a small non-government uh, organization here in the kingdom that works uh, mainly into empowering young women and girls here in Tonga. Um, the work that we do is uh, at Dalita is we provide programs, um, empowerment programs um, um, for young girls and uh, women here in Tonga. And we educate them on various um, issues such as climate change and um, gender inequality and um, gender-based violence, uh, amongst many other um, issues. 
Um, specifically, I can uh, talk about our role in the gender-based violence sector. And um, more importantly, I will, uh, would like to speak on um, the issue of gender inequality. Um, gender inequality um, for me has been an issue that has been around our, our society here in Tonga for as long as I can remember. Uh, we grew up um, at home um, with the dictatorship that um, girls had specific roles at home and um, boys had um, um, specific uh, roles as well. And for example, um, I grew up um, knowing that girls are meant to stay home, cook, uh, wash, do the washing, while the boys um, have the freedom of going to the bush or roaming around freely in the village. Now, if you have not um, heard, Tonga had just finished our elections for parliament and candidates from all 17 districts here in Tonga have been voted into parliament. The most fascinating thing about this um, and our election is that we had 12 women candidates that had run for a chair in parliament and none was voted in. Um, statistic had shown that out of the 38,500 votes that were cast, only 4,000 352 were cast for the 12 um, female candidates altogether, and the rest were for the males. Now, as a young woman a leader who had a crazy dream of one day being uh, the first female prime minister for Tonga, um, this result uh, is very disappointing. It's for us women it's forever about earning a right to things. And that is just cruel injustice. Because when asked around to voters why this was the case the, uh, and why they had no, not voted for our women um, representative, the answer was they had not earned it. And that is why I emphasize for us women, it's forever about earning a right to things and that is cruel injustice. Now, our work at Thalitha Project, we have program, um, a program called the Front Row Against Violence Program, in which in part we partner with UN women and we strive to create equal opportunities for young women to participate in rugby and not just by playing, but also coaching and being a referee. We also move into educating executive members in rugby about gender inequality uh, and changing that into and changing that mindset into gender equality. Um, I, um, as in mindful of time, um, I want to quickly um, conclude um, by with the statement that the work that we do at Talitha Project um, is unique because we strive to empower our girls with knowledge about the various issues around themselves so they, they can be informed about it. Um, we also strive to empower our young girls from within themselves. And I can say that with confidence because I was once that little girl who was very passionate about helping make a change in my country and in the world. And I wouldn't have been disempowered with all the knowledge to see the many, uh, the many issues around me if it weren't for the, the programs that I had been involved with with the Letha Project. Um, I think that's it from now from me, but um, I can carry on um, later on with the questions that would come in. Thank you so much. Ana Maria, thank you so much. Uh, Malopito. Uh, don't go away. Uh, we are going to have the question and answer session after this, and I'm sure there'll be a lot in the audience who will want you to elaborate on uh, some refreshing uh, viewpoints that you've uh, raised with us in the three minutes. Uh, particularly, I uh, was uh, interested in your comments and observation about uh, uh, recent, the recent result of your general elections and the call for better and just representation of women in, in the common parliament. And uh, quite like the idea of rugby, uh, not only having uh, women uh, or girls playing rugby, but also coaching as well as being referees, being the boss on the rugby playing fields. So again, as a reminder to those of us in the audience, 
please do send through your questions. Questions for any member of the panel. Uh, you've heard from uh, Ana Maria Palemarca, uh, law student and uh, activist with the Talibur Project in Tonga. You've also heard from Isteli Vulovo, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Pacific Sexual and Gender Diversity Network. Uh, it's a, lot, a lot of work they do uh, with the LBGTI. And also, uh, our, our first um, our panelist was uh, Gabriel Shirley Copas, who's still with us. And you're most welcome to send through your question. The, the, the great work that they do in Papua New Guinea, uh, Magna Carta, she's the founder of Magna Carta Papua New Guinea. Uh, particularly on the extraction and support for uh, survivors of uh, uh, sorcery uh, allegations and sorcery attacks. So that, that's something that you can raise and send through in your questions using the Q&A button and as well as the chat button on the software, uh, the Zoom software. Last but not the least, our fourth member of the panel is Junior Paul joining us from beautiful Majuro in the Republic of Marshall Islands. Junior Paul is the Associate Commissioner for Secondary and Career Education with the Republic of the Marshall Islands Public School System. Uh, Junior, thank you for uh, being patient with us. Uh, for your three minutes opening statement, briefly tell us the work that you do uh, with the uh, secondary school uh, students in Marshall Islands, please. Good morning, Yahweh. Yeah, well, um, thank you, moderator. Um, Excellency, distinguished uh, leaders, my fellow colleagues, Pacific Fault colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Yahweh, yeah, well, in uh, creating from the Republic of the Marshall Islands, uh, on behalf of the Marshall Island Ministry of Education, Sports and Training, the Honorable Minister Kibalan Kapua, the National Board of Education, Public School System Commissioner, Mr. Kenji Ochia, along with my colleagues at the central office, uh, principals, teachers, staff, students, parents, I would like to firstly thank the Pacific Island uh, Forum uh, Secretariat and the partner of this webinar for the warm invitation. Um, it is indeed a great privilege and honor to participate in this event. Um, during the Marshall Islands, the, the beauty lies in our rich culture and tradition of sharing, um, respect, love, peace, and harmony. Um, these values have been passed on from generation to generation with a positive intention of keeping the yucca spirit alive. As a matrilineal uh, society, women traditionally hold the highest respect and power over the land. A girl born into a family is known as Yip Chaltuk, or basket facing towards you, symbolizing the opportunities and resources that a woman would bring in and or keep within the family. Yip Chaltuk, or a basket facing outwards, is a phrase to find a voice, boys as they would take their opportunities and, and their resources to the family he marries into. Uh, regardless of their gender, it is recognized that both women and men would have a set of knowledge, skills, talents, and strengths to benefit her or his family and their communities. With the utmost respect, given the girls, they are also seen as mother. Mothers of our lands and of our nation, mothers or women take on many titles and responsibilities upon their shoulders. They are peacemakers or Kurei Nyoyo and the nurturer Chinir Kuber and Tayar Chinir Unfortunately, due to gender inequalities, there are more than 50% of reported cases of violence toward women and girls in the RMI. Uh, this is alarming as it infringes on women's rights, hinder our values, and obliterate, obliterate our identities as Muslim people. However, 
through the social citizenship education programs, uh, teacher capacity trainings con contr contributes to enhancing on gender equality and prevention of violence against women and girls. Implemented by the Pacific Communities uh, SPC Human Rights and Social Development Division with the funding from the European Union through Pacific Partnership to and Violence Against Women and Girls uh, Pacific Partnership Program. The Social Citizenship Education Programs equip schools, students, and communities to understand and apply the human rights and responsibilities, gender equality, inclusion, and nonviolence. Although this is the first year we are implementing the new integrated social, social citizenship education curriculum, the RMI pilot schools, there are already positive impacts and we expect to see more positive impacts as we continue to support our teachers and students. Um, linking our cultural values and beliefs through Pueblenados or Talanoa uh, or lesson, legends, Chaban Kannan or Proverbs, Al, Psalms, we are able to convey our teachers and students that, uh, and our students that these are not new or foreign concepts to us. At our initial training session, our competency tests resulted in an increased understanding on the topic of social citizenship education among the teachers. If our teacher understands this concept and our culture, which promotes behaviors and values, they will be able to teach this concept and contribute to our students becoming the Marshallese and global citizen that we strive for in our public school system mission. Since our initial training, uh, initial teacher training in July, 2021, we've trained nearly 100 teachers in both secondary and primary levels. Eight curriculum specialists conducted eight training sessions with the ninth uh, training session currently taking place as we speak and supported in the establishment of the six social citizenship education student-led clubs, where students take on the initiative on being a good Marshallese citizen and to the exercise the social citizenship education principles as role models to their peers and their communities. With continued support provided by SPC Human Rights and Social Development, and, uh, and our curriculum instruction and assessment team at public school system, along with teaching and learning resources, such as poetry anthology, universal declaration of human rights poster, videos and readers, and the teacher guide, we will continue to see positive results and be closer to achieving our mission. Although this is the only beginning, we are moving forward to further educate and provide support to resilient citizens. Uh, with that being said, I will now end my words uh, with this martial aid proverb. If our collective knowledge, skills, balance, and strengths come together, a lot can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Junior Paul. Um, lots of interesting stuff we learned there, and I'm sure a lot of interesting stuff we will want to, or the audience will want to ask and get you to elaborate more. So thank you for the questions that have started to come in, and uh, I've been asked that the questions to be put through on the chat button of your Zoom uh, software. So uh, apologies for that. Uh, just uh, if you have any questions, uh, directed at uh, any member of the panel, please put it through the chat uh, button option. And the first question goes to Anna Malia, our youth uh, representative uh, from Tonga. Um, 
The question is, what are two challenges uh, you face in your empowerment work with young girls in Tonga? If you can name two challenges that you do come across when you do your work, empowerment work with uh, young girls uh, in the kingdom. Um, thank you for that question. Um, um, I would just like to begin with, um, personally for me, um, if there was a challenge that I face personally um, with the empowerment work that we do, um, for me it would be about balancing um, everything in my life because I, um, I do have school, um, I have family commitments, I have uh, church commitments and also um, the work that I do with Talitha. So I think that is uh, a challenge for me. It's just being able to equally balance everything that is going um, um, going on in my life so that um, none of the things will be overlapping. But for me, I do not um, see it as a challenge. It's, it's always an opportunity for me. It's always an opportunity in which... Um, um, I can learn more and I could um, gain experiences in the areas. And um, I think the other challenges, uh, the other challenge uh, as well is um, as a young person, uh, sometimes we are not always taken serious by our, our leaders, our world leaders. Um, you know, some of, most of the time our elders and our leaders um, see me uh, particularly as well as other young girls. Um, and say that, you know, we're too young, um, we do not know um, what is going on. Um, and um, um, that is another challenge is that, um, you know, not being able to take, to be taken serious and um, sometimes not having my voices and the voices of others, you know, behind me um, being heard on decision-making um, um, platforms. So I think that's, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna Malia. We'll come back to you because there's another question uh, coming through to uh, wanting your response to that. But first of all, before we do that, let's uh, go to Gabrielle Shirley Kaupa. Oh, and the question just flip up. Uh, there's a question from Wendy uh, for you, uh, Gabrielle. Why has the organization in PNG chosen the name Magna Carta, a Latin name, which is a history in the United Kingdom? Um, thank you, Wendy, for your question. Yes, everyone like to ask me why I'm having this name Magna Carta. So Magna Carta derived from a social justice program in a boys' secondary. When I was teaching in one of the boys' school, a Catholic agency school called Dilassal College Bomana, I have a social justice club. So through the social justice club, it came Magna Carta. So when I was having um, that very strong motivation in me to you know, start a, an organization, human rights organization, I was looking for names. And at the same time, it was the 100, 100th century of Magna Carta. And then it reflects back to my history class in, in the national high school or secondary school. And I had uh, my... Um, History lecture was talking about Magna Carta, the first book of charter, um, the Charter of um, Human Rights that was written by King John of England. So when I did um, in-depth research and reflection, I said, okay, human rights is all about the rule of law, the constitution, the international conventions and treaties. And it's all about educating people about the law. When you know the law, and when you have an effective law, you, it, you know, control the country, it runs the organization, it puts everyone into the straight path. And a lo lot in our space in human rights, it's all about going back to the books, our constitution, our acts, everything that talks and promote and protect human rights is based on the rule of law. So it gives me that very strong um, that very strong motivation that it has to connect to something about the rule of law. So I put the name Magna Carta PNG. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Before I go next to Isikeli Bulago, there's a question for you, and then back to Anmalia. Uh, just out of curiosity, Gabriel, 
can you briefly explain the uh, is that uh, representative is that a traditional costume the painting on your face uh, can you just briefly explain for those of us who don't know thank you very much yes um it's a symbolic a cultural uh melanesian value that talks about equality the cap that i wear uh, men and women are equal and equal in decision making equal in holding powers and we are all equal in whatever a role doesn't define agenda agenda doesn't define a role we all equal so it's promote equal um, gender that's the head and this one um, you know it's kind of a title a position that the chiefs used to so as a woman i also have the right to all titles uh, to represent my people uh, you know whether in the political space, in the bureaucrats, in decision making. So that's this attire that I wear. And this paint is, uh, it's all about positivity. So if I put a black paint, that's a warrior fighting. So today it's all about voices of challenge, uh, bringing out positive message. So I put the bright colors to bring out the positive message of um, working in collaboration, working in partnership, to reach the unrich and to raise the voices of those that they cannot, you know, raise their voice. So we want to bring, we want to actually um, relook or re-strategize and bring <coughs> positive messages, some of the messages that we don't bring. And it has to be inclusive. And we, we join hands with boys and men in all areas to talk about uh, gender-based violence, child protection, sorcery accusation, related violence, whether in policy gap, in implementation, and all the other uh, activities that we do. So thank this you. color is positive. Amazing. Thanks. Amazing, and thank you for doing that, and thank you for explaining to us. Thank you. Well appreciated. Thank you, Gabriel. To Isikeli, how engaging have faith-based institutions been in discussions around gender equality and LGBTI. How engaging have faith-based institutions, our churches have been in discussions around the gender equality and LGBTI. Thank you, Sami. Um, we are lucky that we have had some experience within the network of uh, national member organizations that have uh, reached out to faith-based uh, organizations to assist them in the work of changing people's mindset, um, mental attitudes, and also uh, their perceptions, and most importantly, their behavior towards uh, LGBTQI people. So in Fiji, we have a national member organization called the Rainbow Pride Foundation, which is currently working with the Fiji Council of Churches to try and uh, build a bridge between the LGBTQ community and the faith-based community, and at the same time try and um, develop or think about ways in which the church can change or reverse some, or change some of the narratives. The narratives that often are uh, weaponized by people within the church to dehumanize uh, LGBTQ people to make them feel uh, smaller okay, or unimportant or under uh, or some as different uh, from other people in the society. So, and th that experience has taught them also that um, it also depends on the people that are holding leadership positions within the church. Uh, the more progressive ones, if, if you're lucky, if you have a progressive leader uh, within the church uh, at the helm of uh, uh, the leadership within their uh, respective church, uh, the chances of you progressing that work is higher. And through them, you hope that you will be able to influence other church leaders. So that's what the Rainbow Pride Foundation is doing. Uh, luckily, with the current uh, president being the Archbishop, um, the, the Archbishop for the Catholic the, uh, Subadio, Archdiocese, uh, who's very progressive. He has 
uh, been able to um, open the door for that conversation to take place. Thank you. And uh, they are also lucky because they have the General Secretary for the Future Council of Churches, who's also very supportive. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Skelly. Thank you for that. Uh, I now go back to Anna Malia and uh, Junior Paul. I have a question for you too. So after Anna Malia's question, then I'll come to you. Uh, thank you for such an impressive opening. This is uh, the question. What do you think it will take to get women into political or high level leadership in Tonga? What will it take to get women into political leadership? Your thoughts, Anna Malia? Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think a basic answer to that is that I believe it will take the unity of the women here um, in Tonga to get um, women into political or high-level leadership in Tonga. And I say that because majority of the voters in our last election and majority of the populations here in Tonga is made up of women. But as shown in the results of our general election, um, majority of the, the women had voted for men instead of the uh, instead of our women candidates, and I think it's it's due to um, you know to reasons such as you uh, competitiveness, um, you know that mindset that um, um, wow. as women we don't want to see um, other people succeed, so. Um, for me, it's basically about uniting our women's um, um, in all our countries so that we may be able to stand together because um, like here in Tonga, we hold majority um, uh, of our population. So, you know, it's just about empowering our women, you know, and changing the mindset for them to see that not only men can be in these roles and then and you know we have we have the capabilities and the rights to be um in those um political and high level leadership um i think that's it for me thank great, you great response thank you Anna Malia. Anna Malia falemaka one of the uh, activists with the talita project in kingdom of tonga now we go to majuro marshall islands uh, associate commissioner junior paul a uh, question came through with uh, first a comment, then a question. Uh, um, what are interested on the cultural issues uh, that you encounter as you bring this new approach into the classrooms? Because the, the questioner says educators tend to have traditional attitudes. Now, the question is, what have been the early impacts uh, that you are seeing in your um, in your discussion in your talks with, with the, the primary and the secondary students uh, under this program, particularly on gender-based violence. What have been the early impacts that you're seeing and what also have been the feedback? Have you got some feedback from the parents now that they learn that their children are, are learning to about uh, uh, gender-based violence? You have to unmute uh, yourself, Junior. Paul, thank you. Thank you very much, um, moderator. Um, and once again, Yakwe, uh, greetings. Um, to address your questions in terms of the impacts, uh, first of all, I, I will start off with uh, you know the challenges of teachers, principal, or parents and community being resistant to uh, teaching social citizen education topic to students. And um, of course, the, the misunderstanding about uh, these issues in our nation. So. Uh, Cassie stands, stands for gender equality. Sorry, Junior Paul, go ahead. Um, I brought up two points to um, respond to the questions. Uh, there was challenge of teachers, uh, principals and parents being resistant to 
teaching AC topics to uh, students. And then of course, uh, the misunderstanding about what this is used in our nations. So over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we are fast running out of time again, as usual. It usually happens when the Pacific Talanoa and they have lots of questions and uh, they want to have a lot of discussion. Can I go to you again, uh, Gabriel, before we wrap up? Um, can you talk a, a bit about, you know, the sorcery uh, allegation uh, work that you do to support the, 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 the survivors? I know it's a difficult subject to talk about and I, more than an hour to talk about this, but the way forward, the solution, what you think, because we, we keep seeing from time to time the headlines going up about uh, a, a woman or a group of women being a, a victims of a sorcery allegation, uh, losing their lives uh, in some cases. What you think should be the solution? What should not only Papua New Guinea, but the... Uh, the rest of the Pacific we're talking about, particularly as you heard from the Secretary General, they're talking about a review of their gender declaration. So what's your thoughts on that? Um, thank you, um, Chair. So sorcery accusation related violence is the, the worst, the deadliest uh, form of uh, abuse on the weak people in our societies. And uh, in Papua New Guinea, um, from the policy level to other programs, um, the CSOs with the donor partners and the state, they're working hard to address that issue. But yet uh, we have a lot of challenges. And um, from Magna Carta's um, engagement during the COVID, uh, which was last year till this year, we identified uh, challenges along the referral pathway. And um, one of the, the thing, the critical um, issue is um, access to justice. And that's where when we have um, ineffective policing. Ineffective policing, one of the things that we were talking about is uh, police uh, witness protection. Police witness protection is a, an issue that we talked for the last 10 years and we keep on talking. Our safe houses in PNG are not safe when we have high risk, high risk cases. Uh, that's one. And two, if the witnesses are protected by the police, then we have a very strong case and enforcement of penalty and pr prosecution by the law will be strong. So our strong messages will go out. And uh, I know um, Dr. Okula who was engaged in that space for a very long time and we've learned from her and we actually entered that space and she has a lot on that and she's a specialist as well. And um, acknowledging her, She's here with me in the space, and also um, she was the one that bridged me to uh, to talk on this uh, panel. Yes, so we're still having that issue of uh, as access to justice. How effective will the police prosecute or the courts can penalize those perpetrators? Recently, we have three uh, cases that it went through the courts, um, one in Madang and two in Port Mosby, and we achieved. And that's a very good um, story for us in the space. And we would like more of that to happen. So from us, uh, the CSOs and the police, um, we should work more into looking at improving witness protection and protection given to the victims and survivors. So we have a lot to do with the service pathway of uh, sub and gender-based uh, violence survivors and uh, victims. We need to improve. We need to improve that from the police to the courts and also to keep our victims and how we can integrate them back into the communities. 
we don't want that stigma and discrimination and we don't want people to you know demean their human dignity and see them that they are this all these social things are all just make up stuff that someone with uh, power plays you know using this masculinity uh, power and this to actually inflict pain and suffering to the weak in the society so when we have this uh, gap we need to really uh, fill that gap with the uh, partners, the police, to really make sure that um, law is there to penalize perpetrators. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Unfortunately, time is caught up with us. So I'll, to, to wrap up, I'll, I'll go through the, the whole panel. If you can just give a sum up in, say, a minute or two, your final statements. And I want to start first with Isi Kelly. Uh, in, in your summing up, Mr. Kelly, I wonder whether you can also uh, talk about what you think is the solution uh, to these disturbing uh, statistics that uh, that study that you mentioned uh, showed about 84%. I wonder if I'm getting my figures correct. 84% uh, of uh, uh, LBGTI uh, people uh, being victims of physical and intimate partner violence, and about 44% of those uh, not reporting those uh, incidents of violence. So this culture of silence and this culture of violence on the um, minority uh, uh, sector of our, of our population. What's the solution? That's a suggestion from you. Do we still have Isikeli with us? Okay, good luck Isikeli. For your final uh, wrapping up and final statements, thank you. We will need to unmute yourself as well, Isikeli. Naka. Sorry, uh, thank you, Sami. Yes, that's a difficult uh, question uh, to answer regarding, um, you know, the solutions. How can we effectively address a physical, intimate partner violence um, among uh, lesbian, uh, bisexual, uh, and gender non-conforming uh, and queer women? This. Uh, not much that um, has been done to um, try and find out a little bit more on why uh, on why there is such a high level of violence uh, among you know women. These are women, people who identify as women, uh, and this was something that I was thinking about also uh, this morning as I was reviewing uh, my notes. Uh, and like one key thing that I Okay, thought that I came up with was we needed we need to find out a little bit more of why uh, there's a high level of uh, intimate partner violence among women uh, themselves. Say so these are uh, lesbian women or bisexual women, uh, queer women or uh, gender non-conforming uh, persons. And I guess this also goes back to the uh, what I said about the culture of uh, silence, uh, not. Uh, Many uh, of these cases are reported to uh, the police or to relevant uh, authorities. And for uh, I, I think for me as a member of the LGBTQI uh, community, maybe some of the the external factors that we face as uh, people who are often marginalized uh, in society can also contribute to um, you know couples. Uh, those who are in same-sex uh, relationships, um, instigating violence uh, against the other, the other person, and also because of the, you know, the marginalization, the discrimination, and the violence that we face from those outside our community, can also pressure, um, you know, members of our community to commit violence also towards their intimate. Uh, intimate partner. And I guess for us as a community, one of the things that we are trying to do is to build the capacity, the self-esteem uh, within uh, within the movement, uh, understanding um, 
key conducting training where we get to um, understand more about ourselves and also talking about the issues that we face uh, as a community openly so that we know how we can share stories uh, of how we can cope you know with the stresses uh, that we face because of how society uh, oppresses us so that uh, you know when we are in intimate uh, partner relationship we know how we can uh, withstand those pressures and be able to continue to treat each other uh, uh, decently so we're involving the uh, the personal and we also provide uh, uh, counseling uh, sessions and provide safe spaces uh, for our community where they can congregate and have uh, more open conversations around these issues so that uh, they know that you know there's a way of getting things uh, you know negative thoughts uh, out of out of their mind out of their body and uh, learning also how to be able to deal with this by accessing uh, the relevant services that are available for uh, LGBTQ people, particularly those who are facing problems within their relationships. Thank you. Now, Walia, we see Kelly Bulawo, the CEO of Civic Sexual and Gender Diversity Network. Junior Paul, for your final concluding remarks. If you unmute and then Okay, thank you very much. So once again, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, for the final remarks, um, you know, it's an important to say that um, one of the proverbs I say at the end of the remarks, Kajoro uh, Dwar, meanings, uh, So meaning said um, we need to be, we need to come together as uh, to make uh, this work as a success and um, ensuring that we respect the rights of the women and girls in our nation. So to all the women you know, and girls out there, we have the right to be who you are. Thank you. Thank you for those inspirational statements, uh, Junior, Paul. Uh, finally, before you go, uh, you are a former teacher yourself, former school uh, deputy principal yourself. Uh, what's your recommendation be? Uh, you think it, it is a good concept to have gender-based violence uh, teachings uh, to secondary school and primary school students that the rest of the Pacific should also consider having that like you do in the Marshall Islands, what's your recommendation? Uh, yes, this is a good, good opportunity, good, um, good initiative that needs to be in the school curriculums um, based on experience and um, observation. Um, through teacher trainings, um, we see a lot of changes in attitude towards uh, it's the concept. Uh, even though it's it's a new a new initiative to integrate implement, but I too recommend that we must have this in our school program. Thank you, thank you very much for that, Junior Paul. Then to you, Anna Malia, the future leader of the Pacific, uh, for your uh, final remarks. Uh, what uh, inspirational message you want to leave uh, uh, with us, Anna Malia? Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, moderator. Um, um, I just want to keep it simple uh, with my main message that I leave with you guys today is that um, there is forever hope and there is hope that um, we can still achieve uh, gender equality um, here, not only here in the Pacific, but worldwide also. And um, I do wish um, that we continue on collaborating. Um, as someone had um, I mentioned in the chat, um, collaboration is key because we are stronger together, especially in advocating on these um, issues. So um, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Anna Maria Falemaka, a law student and uh, activist 
with the Italida uh, project in the Kingdom of Tonga. Final, but not uh, least, but final member of the panel, not the least, of course, um, Gabriel Shirley Kopa, founder of Magna Carta, Papua New Guinea. Your final remarks, uh, Gabriel, and thank you again for bringing a lot of positivity and uh, specific vibrant colors uh, to the webinar today uh, with the explanation of the, of the costume that you have for us today. Your final remarks, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sami Sami. We have learned many lessons so far as individuals, organizations, and as a country, uh, a state, PNG. Uh, we understand issues are cross-cutting, and if we see a solo work in partnership, we improve our partnership level and our collaboration with our state and other diplomatic partners and uh, international development agencies. I know we will do a lot and we will improve better. And with that, um, we hope and we will continue to raise our voices, collective voices, voices for all, and we'll continue to fight the good fight and we keep the spirit up and we involve everyone in our society. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, God bless you all. And keep safe during this COVID time. Thank you once again. Keep up the great fights. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriel Shirley Kapwa, the founder of Magna Carta uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, our fourth member of the panel today. And uh, uh, to wrap up and to conclude, I want to leave with you the um, message uh, that uh, the Secretary General Henry Puna opened our webinar uh, this morning with, and that is the uh, the review of the uh, Pacific Islands Forum Pacific Gender Equality Declaration that's currently ongoing. Uh, they're doing the review because the leaders of the Pacific feel that the declaration needs to be relevant and fit for purpose. A lot of the great suggestions that all of you had come up with today, I think should go into that uh, review. And I would encourage each and every one of you to put in those suggestions uh, to make that uh, gender uh, Pacific Gender Equality Declaration more relevant and fit for purpose. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, members of the panel, for the great work that you're all doing and keep it up. As uh, Secretary General Puna said, you know, uh, we must stop gender-based violence in the Pacific. We should stop it now. And uh, it's today, of course, marks the start of the uh, 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. We wish all our women all the best and all our men too, as uh, Jenny Paul said, we must uh, uh, respect and uh, promote uh, equality uh, amongst uh, our partners and our, our women, uh, whether they be our partners, our wives, or our, our, uh, our uh, mothers, or our doctors even. So thank you for that, and thank you for joining us. Those of you who sent, sent through your questions, sorry if you had sent your question and we didn't have time to look at them, but. Uh, I noticed that uh, even members of the panel will uh, respond to some of your questions. Until the next time, under the Blue Pacific Calendar Series, thank you so much from Suba Fiji, and uh, you do have a, a great weekend, everybody. Mwale Inaka. Thank you. Thank you to our sign interpreters as well, Tina and Inise. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Naka. Thank you, Olgeta. Bye. Thank you, Olgeta. Thank you. Thank you.